Welcome everyone to Climate Ventures Mornings. Uh, this event series is hosted by the Center for Social Innovation and Climate Ventures. Climate Ventures Mornings are a chance to hear from innovators and leaders working for climate justice and climate solutions. In the past, we've hosted conversations with Environmental Commissioner Diane Sachs, uh, and, most, and most recently in April with clean tech pioneer Nick Parker. And today we're honored to have Melina Lubukan Massimo joining us, and uh, we're going to, to get to that conversation in just a moment. At CSI, we always start our events with an acknowledgement of the land, uh, even when they're virtual events. So this morning, we want to acknowledge that for those of us who are joining from Toronto, we're gathering on the, on the traditional territory of the, the Huron-Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, the Seneca, and the Mississauga of the Credit First Nation. As we think and talk about social innovation, we are sometimes discussing a shared vision for a sustainable and just future. However, it's critical that we also reflect on the past and the present to consider how we can strive towards more inclusive, resilient communities that incorporate and respect many different ways of knowing and being. And as we move our work and our lives in, into the digital realm, this also means considering how patterns of inequality can transcend into these online spaces. On that note, uh, we want to share this quote from Alexander Dirksen on decolonizing digital spaces. Meaningful change begins with recognition of technological innovation as a fundamentally human endeavor. Behind the sleek glass and metal enclosures of our lithium, of our lithium charge lifelines are people with each line of code carrying with it all of the complexities of human existence. Technology is not a neutral force, nor are digital spaces safe spaces for all. Instead, mirroring, replicating, and at times exacerbating the real and pressing realities faced by Indigenous peoples and other marginalized communities in physical spaces. A social justice lens must therefore be applied to all that we discuss, design, and develop in the digital realm. So we encourage you to consider what it might look like in your work to apply a social justice lens, whether you're also hosting emergent conversations or if you're participating in them and shaping them. We'll add a link in the chat also to a resource called Native Land where you can learn more about the land that you're on today. And without further ado, I'm happy to introduce our moderator for Climate Ventures of uh, mornings today, Shay Sinnott. Uh, Shay is a senior programs manager with CSI, where she manages climate ventures and the, Earth, and the Earth Tech Accelerator program. Before CSI, Shay worked for many years in environmental justice as an organizer and educator on different campaigns and projects, including for the David Suzuki Foundation and Organize BC. Shay, I'll pass it over to you to share a bit more about our amazing guest today. Great. Hello and good morning. Uh, thank you, Zoya, for kicking us off. And thank you so much to all of you, so many of you, for being here. Uh, while I normally live and work at CSI and, um, and Climate Ventures in Toronto, I'm actually calling in from the West Coast, uh, where I'm from. I came back here to be with family. So it is morning for me and Melina. Um, and I'm here on unceded Coast Salish territories, uh, the lands of the Sunamuk and Comox peoples on Vancouver Island. Um, and I'm absolutely delighted to introduce our guest, Melina Labukan Massimo. Uh, Melina is a member of the Lubukan Cree, and among many impressive things, um, she's the founder of Sacred Earth Solar, the co-founder of Indigenous Climate Action, a David Suzuki Foundation Fellow, I could go on, and the host of APTN's uh, Power to the People. Um, hi, Melina, how are you? Hello, good morning. And where are you today, remind us? I am on unceded Coast Salish territory as well. I'm calling in from Klohus First Nation territory on Northern Gulf Islands. Great, good morning. Good morning. Um, so I first heard about you, Melina, uh, back in 2013. I believe I saw you speak for the first time at Power Shift in, in Victoria. Um, it stayed with me since. Um, I was involved in climate organizing at the time. Um, and then over the years, have kind of continued to hear about you, hear about Melina over the years. Um, not only fighting for climate justice, but also really pushing for climate solutions and, and specifically renewable energy. Um, so it really intersects with the work that um, I do now, we do now. Um, so I'll admit that I've been really excited about today, but also really nervous um, because I respect you so much. So thank you so much again for being here. Um, maybe just to start us off, if you could share more about, um, you know, where you come from and your journey to your, your current work. Kanseguakia, Nia Molina Miawapin Labukan Maso, Nia Nikiao, Kinas Kumtanawao, 
Um, hello, everybody. Thank you, Shay, for inviting me here to have this discussion with Center for Social Innovation in Climate Ventures. I'm, um, it's nice to have a one-on-one -on -one discussion as opposed to a presentation, but so this is a new um, way to have discussions, but um, it's nice to include everyone from across the country. Uh, that's, that's something new, I guess, instead of just being in the centralized local one location. Yeah, but totally. yeah, so my name is Melina Lubokan Masmo. I was born in Little Buffalo, Alberta. I am Lubokan Cree, which is in northern Alberta, and um, it's a small northern remote community uh, about five hours north of Edmonton in the northwest region in the peace country. And it's a beautiful, beautiful area. And so I was born into that small community. Um, my grandparents, my cookum and Muslim, we say grandmother and grandfather, um, actually didn't speak English. They only spoke Cree and they raised my dad, um, removed from the residential school system at, in the beginning parts, um, nine years of his life. He was hidden from the Indian agent that would come in and take all the children. So I'm actually the first generation um, on my dad's side to um, not attend residential schools because he eventually went to a day school, um, which were just as intense um, in experience of the beatings and the type of kind of language removal and cultural removal that went on with, with the children and assimilation processes. So um, that's the community that I come from. And I, I really have such good memories um, for me anyways, because I wasn't taken from the community of being with my, <clears throat> my grandparents, my aunts and uncles, my cousins, running around playing outside, um, especially in the summers um, with the dragonflies and with all the just amazing beauty that is the boreal forest, the northern lungs of Mother Earth. So from a young age, I definitely fell in love with the north and with the boreal and with just Mother Earth in the forest. And so we would go in the summers in the horse and wagon with my grandparents, which was, and we go in our traditional territory and the trap lines and, and just see the beauty and the vastness. And so those are like very young, um, early childhood memories that really informed um, why I do the work today that I do um, when I was as I grew up and um, as my mom needed to go find work and went, went to school. So we went to Slave Lake eventually, which is a neighboring mm -hmm. town to um, Low Buffalo. And then eventually we went to the city so my mom could do her master's degree in psychology because she does trauma, trauma informed therapy <clears throat> with residential school survivors. Oh, yeah. And <clears throat> because we had to move to the city, it was a big eye opening experience for me um, because I saw what, how my family lives where we didn't have running water there's no paved roads, um, you know, no, when I went to the city, there was just like swimming pools and running water and libraries and books and all the things. And I was just like, what is this vast discrepancy that doesn't make sense to me why my family would live one way and then in the cities, my people would live a different way. And mm -hmm. so it was, for me, it was very eye-opening and it politicized me from a young age. Um, and so that's, for me, um, trying to, fight um, you know, ad for justice and advocate for indigenous um, land rights because our community also wasn't a signatory of Treaty 8. So we had a longstanding decades and decades before I was born land rights. And when you know my first protest and blockade would have been when I was seven on when our community had shut down the road because oil and gas companies were coming in without the consent of the people. So there was a lot of um, you know, upheaval, I guess. Um, but I, w but I was very lucky to be in a family that was very grounded in um, language and culture, and that really informed who I was as an Indigenous person and in moving forward with the work that I did. And so, eventually, I went to the University of Alberta. Um, pretty young, I graduated from high school when I was sixteen and went right into university. And so it was a another big eye-opening experience of kind of the cultural landscape that existed within Alberta as most people I'm sure in in on this call know there's a very there's huge discrepancies between political views um, that exist and it was you know now it's very polarized and it was similar to that and but I think it just really informed the way that I see see things in the world and the way that I wanted to um, live and kind of be and so eventually I went to university and 
um, finished my first degree and eventually went to um, worked and lived around different parts of the world working in like UN processes and social and environmental justice and work and worked also in community as a as a youth worker and lived in Brazil lived in Mexico went to school there um, and just saw just the same types of discrepancies that exist within Canada in other countries and it really made me um, see the indigenous peoples um, the plight of indigenous peoples existed in all places where um, there was systemic oppression and um, colonization and colonial policies that really impacted the way that people were able to live um, in their homelands and how it disrupted the social social fabric of people um, and so and families and so yeah so eventually I moved back to um, the west coast back to Alberta and started campaigning um, in Alberta as a Greenpeace campaigner, which I'm sure isn't very popular for some people, but for me it was, my mom had just um, been diagnosed with cancer, and for me it was very closely linked as she was going in and out of the community for a decade, um, a community in Fort Chippewan where she was a psychologist and would work with community members there, and um, so it was very real, very real um, for us in our communities of how we are impacted by in, in industrial extraction and resource extraction and how it affects, you know, health and families and community. And then also mm -hmm. um, how a big oil spill happened a number of years later, actually, probably just after I met you in 2013 and 2011, there was a massive oil spill that really impacted our community. And that really changed the way in which I thought I can campaign and say no to all of these horrible things that are happening back home. Mm -hmm. um, exposure, like toxicity exposure um, to intense chemicals um, and impacting people's health and wellness. But if I don't start building these types of projects, renewable energy projects, mm -hmm. building the, the future of that I wanna see, then I feel like, you know, I felt very disempowered at the time when there was a big oil spill because it just really made me realize like I can't stop the fact that people right now can't breathe. Um, and so it made me, made me want to try to start building things that were safer for my community and my family to be around like solar panels where they, there was, if there's a solar spill, it's just sunny outside and they can still breathe. So, yeah. you know, there's these types of technologies that really excited me that I wanted to start implementing. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. I really wanted to start there um, because it's clear um, in your speaking and your writing um, how family and where you're from and those teachings are just so so uh, such a motivator for your work um can you say a little bit more about the oil spell in little buffalo because i know that that was a big sort of turning point for you uh, maybe like what happened and um and the feelings that that brought up and if there were any other kind of like choice points along the way that led you to where you are now maybe like recent history too yeah, I mean, there's, I think if people want to see something <clears throat> very long, because there's a 10 minute really amazing, um, I didn't edit it, but I want a, a really great um, editor that I worked with at Greenpeace, Oh, she edited and it was just me narrating it. So it's a 10 minute long. So if you want to Google oil on Lubicon land, um, it's I'm on sure YouTube. It and you can just, yeah. yeah, it's a really great kind of overview and shows photos and pictures of the community and the spill and, um, you know, people holding like, beavers and like because it basically the oil spill took over took a beaver dam and it was just an intense type of um experience where my auntie had texted and said you know i can't we can't breathe our eyes are burning she taught at the school for 35 years and just it was it was heart-wrenching it's actually still it's hard for me to talk about still because it's such a tr it was a traumatizing experience um when you know that your family can't breathe and their stomachs are turning and people feel nauseous and that you know you know deep down that in your heart that people should be told by the government or by the company that um pregnant women people with autoimmune issues elders small children should be removed from the community and people were just left to stay in the community and as the you know toxic chemicals were wafting into the community um so that and they shut down the school for two weeks because the teachers couldn't teach people couldn't function it was just like people were getting dizzy and um and they didn't want to have you know have to deal with the health impacts of kids you know throwing up in the school or and all these things you know so they shut the school down and yet people were left and so I think for me um knowing that the and also the way there there was a federal election at the time <clears throat> it was the second time that Harper got voted in so that happened over that week and 
the information to the community actually wasn't released until after the election because wow. they didn't want the the news to go to the media. <clears throat> so they kept it kept it at, um, under wraps, and then they released the information after um, the election. And then when I got a hold of that, I put out you know we put out a press release, and then all the media came up to you know which we never I've never seen media in our community. It's this small northern remote community. It's like everyone knows everyone when you're driving down. Everyone's like, oh, I look high, like, you know, so when you see like global CBC, CTV, like all the news, um, ABTN, all the feet, all the folks driving into your res, you're just like, okay, people are taking this seriously because it ended up being one of the biggest oil spills in Alberta and Canada's history. Um, mm -hmm. So it was right beside our families, you know, like our family's home and where the community um, hunts and traps. And it was a big a muskeg, which filters the water, a natural fil filtration system, which is a, a, an amazing ecosystem for the boreal forest. And so that was just over overrun by oil and, you could see, um, yeah, so it was, you know, our families, people that are still dealing with health issues now um, that were cleaning up that spill. And yet that kickstarted, as you noted, your interest in and passion for renewable energy as a kind of, as an alternative. Um, can you talk about how, I know that your master's project was building a solar project in your community. Can you say more about that? Yeah, um, well, it you know, well, I think a lot of people, and I, and I think the amazing thing about um, the climate movement and the environmental justice movement is that people um, are fighting so hard um, for so many people on the behalf of so many people of future generations. And I have the utmost respect for that, of people dedicating their lives to that. And that's what I did for a number of years, you know, um, for pretty much all of my 20s and, and 30s now. Um, so but I think for me, it was like the, the talking points of like saying, we need a, we need to transition. We need renewable energy. We need, you know, there's all of these studies and all of these things out there that show us that the transition is possible. And, but I'm like, what about now? Like, what about now? Like, if I don't, if I don't have these skills, if my community doesn't have these skills, if the people that are fighting so hard don't have these skills, then we can say it, you know, I was basically realized, like, I can say this till I'm like blue in the face and, you know, I can and hit my hands on the wall and, and, you know, yell and scream. But if I'm, if I don't know how to implement, then I feel like I'm not really doing my part. And so that was for me, um, both things exist. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying the no needs to be the no and the yes needs to be the yes and they all need to coincide of what that looks like for a transition. Yeah, but, absolutely. Um, so, um, but for me, it was just like, I need to start implementing. Like I need to, I need to change the way that I'm campaigning, the way that I'm like trying to affect change. Um, so for me, it was about implementation and building. And so I was like looking for all of these these like programs and places mm -hmm. to like learn this and it just like did not exist you know at the time it was like very few like niche places um where you could potentially become like an electrical engineer which is amazing which is the people that I worked with to put up the project but I ended up going back to do my master's I had did the first part of my master's um, in environmental studies at York University and then my mom had cancer so I moved back to back to Alberta and um eventually finished my second part of my master's at the University of Victoria in Indigenous Governance and looked at, you know, governance structures and governance systems and what what does an energy transition look like <clears throat> within the way that we transition because the governance and all the policy pieces are important for that for the transition to happen. And so um, so I did that and decided to actually implement a solar project as my master's thesis and um, one of my professors <clears throat> at the time, he, I won't say who, but he was just like, why don't you just write a paper about it? Like if you're going to write, you, if you're, you're going to not, you're going to finish like way after other students, like finish their, you know, when you defend and when you do your, you know, do your thesis and defense. And I was like, well, that's okay. You know, it took me at least another year after most people had already defended um, because we had to do fundraising because the funding didn't exist for the solar project. But we, in, in the end, we ended up putting up a 20, 20, 20 0.8 kilowatt system which powers um the health center in the community yeah it's like the most useful master's thesis i've ever heard of actually being i would hope i mean that I, yeah. I resisted for a very long time to go back to do my master's degree right, yeah. i was just like like i'm not a master like what am i a master of you know like i like in yeah. and so i just like i wanted to get life experience um okay. so i worked for a number of years and i was like then after you know a decade of campaigning i was like okay i feel like i have something to say now right something to do something that's directed yeah 
well, I can't say that um, I did much that was useful for my master's degree, but when I was doing my master's, that's why I moved to Toronto. Um, I remember learning about this concept of energy democracy, which I would love to talk more about, sometimes called energy sovereignty or energy independence. I know that you've written and spoken about that. Um, so based on my understanding, quite simply, it's like uh, the right for communities to control their energy systems. Um, can you say more about energy democracy, what kind of what it means to you, um, why it's important, and then also in the context of indigenous sovereignty? Um, yeah, I mean, there's so many things to say about it. It's like a whole, another whole conversation. But I think the the basis that I could say is that, um, it's I mean, it's very apparent that we don't control our energy systems right now. And I think that's unfortunate um, in this in the sense of the way that um, energy literacy and energy um, climate literacy is given in schools um, is the reason why we have climate change. And and there's just there's just a lack of inclusion of of citizens, of people that are part of their energy systems. And it's just the special, the specialists and the expertise. And of course we need to always have people that are very like, very fine tuned in, in the skill of electricity because it is dangerous yeah. and it's high voltage and it is powerful and it's amazing. But, mm -hmm. um, but I think it's just sad that we don't have more of an inclusion of um, people in our energy systems. And I feel like energy democracy or energy sovereignty, at, at energy sovereignty as we call it at, um, at sacred or solar indigenous climate action is that people having the the control of their own energy systems so whether that be small scale off-grid or even on-grid um being able to control or have community owned energy systems and we see like great models like this to a certain extent in in germany with co-ops like energy co-ops um but i think what we don't want to see with the transition and is a replication or like rep replicating essentially systems that just continue to colonize and monopolize um the entirety of like you know people's people's ability to live and so we see that within the fossil fuel industry where it's just it's it's basically dominating there there people don't have a choice and i think that's the sad thing about you know and i can speak to this from lived experience where my family members and if i were to stay home and want to have a job i wouldn't have any choice but to work and live with industry and for me because i know that it has such a detrimental impact on our homelands and the ability of people's health and and also just the of humanity as a whole with climate the climate um change crisis that we're currently in um i think tra transitioning and including people along the way having community involved in community energy that is energy democracy it's having people have ownership partnership um meaningful ownership where it's where there's more equity um i think when people don't have equity in their energy systems that's when they kind of just check out and they flip a flip a light switch and that's it and then don't think about the coal impacts or the oil and gas impacts or the fracking impacts of, of how that light switch going on, off and on. But when you own your energy, energy system, when you're a part of it, when young people see solar panels and they know that's producing energy for their home or their school, mm -hmm. there's, there's an involvement, there's a participation. And I think we don't want to, what I meant to say was that the replication is like, we don't want to continue to see a system that that kind of controls and it's like a top-down system but it, it needs to be controlled by people and community owned in the sense of there's been great models that have been now that are now being developed say for instance in a community that i visited out east in Mi'kmaq territory um, where they owned 51 percent of the project and so as opposed to one percent because i've heard of wind wind farms where the first nation that's it's on their homelands they own one percent you know and whoever struck this deal you know, really had a good one on them. And the, the, as the Mi'kmaq have learned, they, they now own, you know, 51%. So that looks like, to me, equity. That looks like partnership. That looks like community involvement. Um, that looks like all of the things that I feel like an energy transition should look like, as opposed to okay. communities, once again, not having involvement and just basically taking, taking the little trinkets that are being offered and not actually really transforming society. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So well put. Um, I remember again, like learning about it, and a, a big aha moment for me was that the issues, like many argue, that the our systems aren't um, kind of messed up, for lack of a better word, because they're highly carbonized, but also because they're highly centralized. And so, as you as you noted, kind of removed from people, they don't have control or ownership, and that that's not only you know in, unjust, especially for indigenous communities, um, but also really ineffective because you see um, if we don't have public 
buy-in um, into projects if people don't feel that they have meaningful participation and hopefully ownership, um, then it's probably not going to work. But if we replace um, fossil fuel systems, say with green tech or renewable energy, but still you see um, people fighting against wind turbines in their backyard. And often people, you know, kind of dismiss that as like NIMBYism, not, not in my backyard. But I think it also proves that um, people really want to say and where their energy comes from, um, or at least what's happening in their communities. People want to say and people want to understand. And I feel like it needs to start from a young age. So part mm -hmm. of when we put up the solar project was creating energy literacy um, teachings in the classroom. So it wasn't just like, oh yeah, we're going to put this project up and, you know, after <clears throat> I need to go back and do another session with the students, but, you know, we went back a number of times and went and did energy. We did energy bingo. We did climate bingo. You know, we did all yeah. for, the, for the, for the older folks that love bingo, but in, in, the, <laughs> in, for the students, they just wanted to know like the grade fives and the grade six is when I went in and be like, what do you think about the solar project? It's right there. Like they literally walk by it every day. Mm -hmm. um, it's, they see it producing energy. We put it right in the community. It's a top of pole mount system. And, um, yeah, I don't know if we can put up the, a link somewhere to so people can see, um, but if you go to, or if you go to Sacred Earth Solar, Sacred Earth Dot Solar, you can see a video, like a three minute video, which shows like that it's like right in the community, it's not fenced off. We did a top of pole so people could see it. Um, and I think just knowing that, that there's a shift, there's a shift that this is where this comes from. And the students were like, you know, grade five and six were like, what happens when the sun doesn't shine? You know, they were thinking about the energy as opposed to just flicking a switch and just thinking, oh, electricity, this is a circuit and not like actually bringing it into like the way that the way that it affects people and the way that they live. Mm -hmm. um, so climate literacy and energy literacy should be more a part of, I think, our educational systems than they already are. Yeah, absolutely. I would love to come back to that too, the, the idea of energy literacy and then um, advice or what you think should happen to, to increase that and to welcome people like us into those conversations. Because I know as somebody that's not an engineer or scientist, it's, it's intimidating to talk about clean tech and renewable energy. Um, and it's, uh, it's hard to learn. So uh, let's come back to that if that's okay. But I'd love to talk about um, Power to the People. So for those that don't know, um, Melina hosts Power to the People. It's a show on APTN released last year and it explores the sort of- Actually released energy. this year. This year? Oh, was yeah, it? Really? Yeah, we were, oh. yeah, yeah. You were filming last year? January, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Um, and so it's, it explores the kind of like energy revolution, also food systems and housing um, in Indigenous communities across Canada. Highly recommend it. Um, I know that uh, we at CSI and Climate Ventures were really excited. There was like lots of enthusiasm expressed over Slack when we heard about the show. And I think um, that's in large part because we're all about, we want to talk about about solutions and tell those stories and hear those stories and amplify them um, and especially when it comes to climate and, and and it's not about the future as you noted before um, things are happening right now and so how can we tell those stories and amplify those stories um, so could you tell us more about the show um, and yeah stories or episodes that you might want to share for those that haven't seen it um, things that you took away yeah um, it yeah it's a so it's a we went to 26 locations across the country um, we profiled 14 Indigenous communities. It's amazing <clears throat> that the amount of stories that are out there that aren't uplifted and aren't kind of people don't know about. So we have currently already over 2,300 small to medium scale Indigenous uh, renewable energy projects in this country. We have over yeah. 180 large scale renewable energy that are like, you know, owned and operated by Indigenous peoples in this country. So it's like, we we had like a plethora of stories to choose from and it was like hard to choose like um which community to choose because there's so many amazing stories but what we decided to do was um try to to like also research and expose the different types of technologies that exist not just to have like a solar story over and over and over again so we have yes we have small scale solar we have microgrids we have stories about large scale wind uh, we have stories about geo exchange biomass district energy um, wave and ocean tidal technology so we went to like the whole gamut and we talked to researchers and experts and we talked to communities and the experts in the communities of how they implemented and it's just amazing food systems food security systems climate adaptation water studies and research and also um, eco housing on the west coast where you know as you know it's very rainy and so how do you change the type of housing that should actually exist in different geographical locations according to their climate and you know the temperatures that they 
they deal with. Whereas for Indigenous communities, I don't know if folks know this, but a lot of times the same housing gets sent into every single same community, CMHC, and just like, and as if like we don't have different requirements and demands of, of um, yeah, of just the way that the climate is in, in mm -hmm. communities. So it, we we studied the whole gamut, and we and we just interviewed amazing community leaders that had you know spent decades, um, some up to decades, some you know more recently, but just have like put in 150 percent of just like working for their community, and it's just like, the stories are amazing because it shows. We also um, looked at like um, offshore um, like open net fish farms and like mm -hmm. the impact of that to West Coast nations. Um, in Alert Bay and so we just like looked at food systems and just how people are living in the country and how people are impacted by you know the, like what we were talking about with cis, like colonial policies and in governmental policies that don't necessarily benefit people and so how people have like said oh, you know what this doesn't work for us so we're going to do it this way and they yeah. just you know are, are like meta like changing changing the way that they live and 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 work within their nations and it was just it was amazing to go to all these communities and yeah, you can go to power to the people i um, mean there's also a website power to the people tv um our website and and then you can go and see like little snippets and stories the aptn one that was just linked is a great one too it shows the timings of so if you have tv i know some of us don't like watch tv um but if you have tv you can watch it every tuesdays and there and it's actually scattered through on hd and sd and different um, channels for APTN so you can watch it for free on, on TV or if you want to watch it online um, for folks that don't have TV and cable you can watch it um, on APTN's um, Lumi L-U-M-I um, it's a streaming service and it's mm -hmm. like I think $4.99 a month yeah it's super cheap yeah TV, so you can watch all the episodes and then all the other content that exists on APTN that's just amazing indigenous media that is just like blowing up in this country of just like yeah it's incredible ingenuity yeah of all these amazing filmmakers so um yeah it's I, it, you can tell it excites me but yeah it's it, yeah no absolutely i, I want to talk more about it um thank you to people that are chiming in on the chat anytime you mention something lena people are just sharing links so that's awesome and we'll definitely share stuff um in follow-up as well as the recording of the chat uh, and the video of course um what maybe quite specifically like are there things that you like what do you hope people take away from the show like what did you learn what do you hope people learn from it are there like key points yeah i i hope that people take away that these models are like you can replicate them and these models you know there are models out there to show people that these solutions exist and are already existing and they're being implemented and they're they're working for communities they are transitioning communities away from 100 percent diesel for some communities um and that's just amazing and and i think that a lot of people feel disempowered because we weren't brought up with climate literacy or energy literacy and and these communities are just changing the game. And I think that we can use these communities' um, stories as inspiration and models for what is possible. And I think I like that it's across jurisdiction. So um, we, because as we know, the energy systems are d differ between each jurisdiction um, because mm -hmm. of the way the grids work. Uh, and so I think that that is, is a really important piece too, that to show that within different jurisdictions, communities were still able to make changes. And I think we could get into the politics of of how some communities um, haven't been able to make changes because of the policies that don't exist or because of the kind of roadblocks because of governmental policy that exists. Um, I'm sure that a lot of people on this call know about or have encountered themselves. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think it just shows that we need to continue to push for progressive renewable energy policy within each ju jurisdiction of this country that includes indigenous participation, that includes small remote communities to be able to make that shift for themselves. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And as you said, it's happening now. This is not something that's happening in the future and that we can replicate it right now. A lot of moments in the show, I remember it's like, we want to show what's happening so that people, especially indigenous people and communities can be like, oh, that's happening there. I could do that in my community. And of course there's complexity and barriers, but um, it's really inspiring to see that that's happening right now uh, and, and uplifting. Yeah, and that there's, it's uplifting, it's inspiring, <laughs> but it's also showing the kind of solidarity that exists or the partnership that exists. And I don't mm. know if you're gonna, this is my- Yeah, I'd love, let's, let's, let's talk about that partnerships. I was gonna ask you about successful partnerships between indigenous and non-indigenous, especially communities, whether it's between like public private um, uh, and companies or um, also governments or municipalities. I would love to hear examples of that. Um, for example, I didn't know about the Six Nations of the Grand River, which is happening very close to Toronto and 
um, yeah, it's just such an amazing example. They're just like, that. they're on fire. I mean, they, yeah. have, they have over 14 renewable energy projects already. Um, and, and we're talking about large scale. I mean, I know the Green Energy Act really helped. The Green Energy Act doesn't exist anymore in Ontario, but I know it did help kind of push that along, but then they were still doing, they're still doing projects now when I was, um, you know, and this policy still doesn't, it doesn't exist anymore, but the, the project that I saw the last one when we were filming was this huge, um, it was like the Nanacoke um, coal area that had basically been kind of gutted. And then now they're building, now that it's decommissioned, they're building solar on top of that. So that's like yeah. the, one of the latest ones. So that's like a partnership between municipality, company, and community. Um, so that exists for, and then their wind farm is between the, the nation and a company, and like an energy developer. And then, um, so I think it depends on like where, because their, their, commun their so community many. is just so spread out. Like yeah. they have one of the biggest um, nations of, in population as well. And it was just amazing. Like you drive through the reserve and you're there, like, there's a Tim Hortons. I was like, there's no way there's Tim Hortons in my reserve. Like, <laughs> not that that's like the end all be all, but it's just funny to see like these types of things, but they are closer, they are closer to Toronto. So, yeah. I mean, we're so remote. So for us, our community was just fundraising. It was like fundraising. So um that's how we did the, that's how we did the project. Um, for other communities, it is, um, say for instance, um, in Taiku River, Klingit First Nation, which is like border of Yukon and BC and Atlin, because they were able to get 100% off diesel um, by this community leader, Peter Kirby, he just did this, such an amazing job that it almost, like it's been 20 years, but he spent 10 years just getting the small, run of the river system and it got their community 100% off diesel but it also got the non the neighboring non-indigenous community off diesel so mm -hmm. I think it's just like you see the benefit of um, the how this works like how the partnerships work if communities and municipalities or um, counties you know depending on where that nation's from are like willing to work with each other I think it's amazing to see and you have to there's sometimes a lot of colonial history and a lot of baggage that needs to be addressed and and I think sometimes um, folks are like Canadians are like conflict adverse sometimes and so they don't want to like get into this like intense history but to be able to do healing and and what we would say true reconciliation is is to be real about the history to be able to heal that and to mm -hmm. kind of work in future partnerships or otherwise I just don't think it's going to happen as well mm -hmm. um, but even um, so that happened for example in the community of Gold Bay First Nation where we went in and we were filming and they have a microgrid and so they have about I think it's 300 panels that that turns off their system of diesel and turns on the system of solar so then they can run on solar um, when it's sunny and when it's producing enough energy and so but that was a long system where they, they actually work with the OPG um, on ten, Ontario power generation. And so they actually, OPG actually apologized um, yeah. to the community for just some really intense history where basically the bodies of their people were floating down the river when they flooded their, their territory without informing the people that lived there. And so like bodies were literally raising out of the, out of the graveyards and just like floating down. And so it was obviously very traumatizing for the community and the people. And so OPG recognized that and actually um, did like a process to kind of bring about healing to the community. And so then this is the project that came out of it because Gold, Gold Bay First Nation will never be on the grid. And so mm -hmm. it's just interesting that communities are right beside these types of energy systems like a hydro dam, but never are, are, are running on diesel. So yeah, it's interesting. Like the stories are just very complex and intricate for each one. So yeah. it's 13 episodes. So people are going to get just like different histories um, of communities and just of, of their country, of the country that, you know, we all live in. And it's, it's just, it's a great show in that respect as well, because it helps people learn about energy systems, but also learn about history. Yeah, absolutely. And building off of that point, um, I think it may be one last point on power to the people. I think what really struck me, um, what I really took away was that it it goes deeper. It kind of highlights through storytelling um, that there's something uh, more that's off about our energy systems or our dominant kind of worldview overall, uh, speaking for myself, um, and what some call kind of uh, extractivism. Um, so a relationship with the earth. And I think Naomi Klein describes it as like one that's based purely on taking. Um, and so it's like, yes, we need to decarbonize and maybe decentralize, but we also need to go deeper and kind of shifting our relationship to each other and to the earth. Uh, the word healing comes up a lot. And so uh, in the show, 
Um, some might call this decolonizing, though decolonizing our energy systems, I, I don't use that term lightly, um, but I'm wondering if you can speak to the kind of this need for a shift in worldview too, in the context of energy and the show. Yeah, um, for, for us as indigenous peoples, I mean, I can speak to the community and the teachings that I come from, um, because each, you know, all Indigenous people have their own teachings, but um, we, for us, there's this really big foundational premise of reciprocity. And so it is not just about taking, it's about when you're taking, what are you giving back? So it creates this like circle of giving or like a sacred hoop that we call. And so, you know, and we're all a part of the sacred hoop. And so we don't see ourselves in like this hierarchy of like, we're the decision makers that we're like, you know, the, the top the top animals, um, it's actually that we're all connected to all things. Like I see a caterpillar right now, that's our relation. A tree is our relation. We're all connected and related to all living beings. Um, even if those living beings don't talk. And so I think for us, it, it's so important to understand that we're not, we can't always take without the impact. There's going to be consequence if you take without, we take too much. And so mm -hmm. I think for us, as an indigenous peoples we're looking at what is regenerative and so for us um you know i'm not going to say that solar's perfect or wind's perfect you know these are transition transition technologies as we get to become less have less of an impact on the environment on the climate but what they are more regenerative right they are based off of an infinite source which is the sun so say for solar um and that's why I called our the the project that I work on sacred or solars is that it's sacred. We have this sacred relationship with the earth, with one another. Um, water sacred. All things, all living things are sacred, and so we have to respect them as such. Mm -hmm. And so for us, um, it is about really for indigenous peoples. Our worldview is is all my relations and that, 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 that saying is something that we say in ceremony as we pray, that we recognize all things in relationship. And so our worldview is very relationship-based um, as opposed to transactional. And so I think that's the difference between kind of capitalism, the capitalistic culture, um, a Western worldview that differs from indigenous worldview of the, the reciprocity and kind of the way that we see um, Mother Earth as like our relationship, and that's why we call her Mother because she's mm -hmm. such a provider for all of us, whether we recognize it or not. Mm -hmm. I remember being like twenty and uh, hearing uh, many Indigenous people uh, uh, say, "All my relations, all my relations," and I remember being like, "What do they mean?" And that, that was like ended up being such a huge learning for me around again not to not a broad sweeping brush all indigenous nations are different but um that that was just like so key around my shift in understanding around the difference in worldview um so thanks for sharing um time's flying this is great um uh, we want to take questions from the group i see some questions popping up in the q a um so we'll get to that soon so is popping on. Um, I have uh, one question. It's a big question. Um, one last question, Zoya, if that's okay. And then we'll turn to questions from, from the group, if that's all right. Um, so it's a big one. Um, but I wanted to kind of talk about our current moment and the, and, uh, the near and long-term future. Um, so we've obviously experienced some unprecedented change. It's been pretty overwhelming these last couple of months. Um, on a kind of macro level, like we've seen the price of oil plummet just as the pandemic hit, uh, emissions drop. Uh, unemployment skyrocket, I could go on, governments announcing like trillions of dollars in spending worldwide. Um, and we're starting to see governments like the EU, I don't know if it's come out yet today, they were talking about it, Spain, South Korea, announcing like green stimulus and Green New Deal kinds of plans. And then even in Canada, just this week, a bunch of uh, hundreds of civil society groups um, launched Just Recovery for All, .ca, if people have heard about it, as well as um, uh, clean energy and clean tech groups launched Resilient Recovery, .ca. So lots of people kind of what would unite them, I would say, would be that it's like, we can't, we need to build back better. We can't go back to, to what, how things were. We can't go back to normal. Um, and so I'm wondering, given this kind of current context, what do you think the future holds um, in the short and long term when it comes to kind of climate action? Big question, but we could end there. Yeah, very big question. I think it, I mean, it really depends on the actions of people in the government, um, what it's going to look like short term and long term. I think it's, yeah, we helped write the Indigenous people's, pr the principles um, for the Just Recovery principles um, for through Indigenous Climate Action. And so we signed on to those and we really support um, the ability for, uh, we would hope that, you know, governments of the day would 
it would provide green stimulus because I think that's what we need to see. Um, we can't just see a continuation of like bailing out um, industries that have really received multiple bailouts throughout the years. Um, you know, obviously we don't want a complete collapse, so we, but we do need to see a transition. And I think we need to see, um, we need to see investment into the systems that actually help us transition our mm -hmm. economy and diversify our economy. We mm -hmm. can't um, kind of put all our eggs in one basket. I'm from Alberta. So, I mean, I'm going to have a critical um, lens on that of like how I view that. I, f I feel like industry, the fossil fuel industry has just gotten away with too much and, you know, where they can leave a lot of their, a lot of their toxicity in the earth and the communities and and around those places where they have made millions and millions of dollars have, you know, and they have left that territory. The communities are left to deal with it. And yet we see also again, tax, tax, um, basically the tax of the people having to go to clean up those those types of projects after the fact. And so I think that um, has left a sour taste in my mouth because I feel like we also need to see a big stimulus, a big investment into renewable energy systems um, more than we've seen from the Trudeau government, more than we've seen from any government previous. And I think we need to look at community countries that are actually leading that and actually saying mm -hmm. like, no, we're going to put a green, green stimulus in and we need to see that because otherwise I just think it's unfair to the green, the green energy um, sector, to the clean tech sector that has just been like doing amazing um, and just like really, um, really just, um, just like I think defying all odds over the past like you know five ten years right. and and with this like with COVID and the collapse I'm just worried that these types of industries and these sectors um, might not be able to continue to kind of grow their exponential growth that we actually need to see in in these clean tech systems and these mm -hmm. green economy green green economy sectors so I think we need to see more of that to ensure that um, it goes into public policy it goes into um, communities and it goes into companies that are really trying to help the transition. Great answer. Yes, like we'll see. And what's positive is that the solutions are there, the examples and the models are there. Um, so it's up to us. Uh, Zoya, wondering what questions have come up. I see lots of questions in the Q&A. Thanks, everybody. Uh, so there's a question from Jamie uh, that says, what role would you like the oil and gas industry to play in our energy transition with three considerations in mind? One, their negative impact on some communities and the environment. Two, that they're a major source of employment and income uh, for the country. And then the third being that renewables are not a perfect substitute for fossil fuels. Um, so that was the question. I'm just looking at the question because it's a lot. <laughs> I was like, I need to read this. Um, what role would you like to play? Um, yeah, I mean, for the first question, the first part of the question, their negative impact, yeah, is is extremely significant. I think that it that there needs to be a lot more um, kind of truth telling and like in and I feel like there's been this polarization between. Um, industry and communities and understandably so there's a there's a lot of anger on uh, from from communities because of the impact you know and a lot of people um in the cities and this is a part of my kind of my my education as a young person coming to the city and being like oh there's like it feels like there's no impact here there's there's no impact and when i go home i see impact everywhere i see the drying out of lands i see um streams and and lakes looking really unwell i see um deforestation i see plumes and smokes and the inability to breathe you know so the the, the experience between um, even Canadians and Indigenous and non-Indigenous communities is vast. And so I think there's this lack of kind of understanding between the two. When I, when I go to Calgary, a lot of times it's like, it's, it's as if like I'm making things up and I'm like, no, this is like a very real lived experience that people live back home in Northern Alberta. So it's like, even between the North and the South, there's, there's this lack of um, understanding because a lack of a non-lived common experience. So it's just, it's, um, so I think that that a lot of the oil and gas industry needs to um, 
really be honest about their impacts. And I think a lot of times that that hasn't happened. So I think, like I said, in, in what, you know, this word that we talk about with in Canada, reconciliation, and I think what we've seen earlier this year um, with reconciliation potentially being dead, you know, like that because there's a lack of truth telling, there's a lack of, you know, people can't heal. Like if, if somebody's wronged you and then they they don't want to apologize or they don't want to say sorry and they just want to continue to live like it hasn't happened. I think that it's very hard for people to move on from that. So I think there, there's something, there's, there needs to be a shift in the oil and gas industry that they are, they are part of the problem and they need to figure out ways to um, make amends with the communities that they've harmed. And they've also harmed humanity as a whole because they've unfortunately, you know, what we've seen is, is, is number of oil and gas um, industries basically leaving out, trying to cover the fact that climate change was happening because it was being exacerbated by um, the oil and gas industry. And so I think there's, there's huge, like we have to consider these impacts and be real about these externalized costs because a lot of times these commun communities are in, you know, taking on externalized costs that a lot of society doesn't want to talk about. And I think that's really unfair. And so I think um, it is significant, like um, Jamie said, that their impact is significant um, and they do play a major role um, in employment income. They do, but I also think it's not as big as most people think think it is um, you know we have other industries and sectors that um, that actually play a big role as well in the way that we transition our not only transition but the way that we are living in in this country and so I think we have to really figure out how to move away from a boom and bust economy and we have to figure out a way that we don't just rely on like one or two sectors we have to rely on we need to diversify our economy and so yes they have they do imply um, provide employment income but but we also realize that by them employing um, employing our people that there's there's a long-term negative impact for short-term gain. And so we need to figure out how to diversify. And so that was the point of us um, putting up the solar project was to start training young people in the community for them to think about, oh, maybe I can become an electrician. Maybe I can become an electrical engineer to start transitioning our people um, into work that actually doesn't impact the land and impact their health and impact the people and impact their communities. So I think we need to look at renewables and I agree that renewables um, are not a perfect substitute um, as I said, because it, they are, they're a transition technology and we still need to figure out how to lessen our impact of, of um, basically taking raw materials out of the earth. Like, you know, like the wind turbines are a lot of um, metal that go um, into these huge, huge towers. And I think we need to figure out how to recycle a lot more of what we've already um, utilized from the earth. Can I ask a very specific question, kind of building off of Jamie's question? I'm wondering about like in the short term, at least, um, do you think there is a role for big oil and gas companies in Canada to play in this transition? Like um, what I find really frustrating is that it seems to be this like entrenched view and that the messaging coming out of Alberta often is still like um, bailout for oil and gas and still moving forward with projects. Like what, would, what might it look like? And what do you think about um, them instead pivoting um, to uh, work in other ways in energy or or do you think that that would work or I'm just wondering about like your take on that because I know that that conversation comes up a lot could they be could leveraged I guess leverage could you say the very part my my wi-fi just um um delayed so could you say the very beginning part of the question because I got the last part but like building from Jamie's question is like is there a role to play especially in the short term and transition for oil and gas um, could they like shift away from oil and gas and instead work on other kinds of en energy, for example? Um, what role can they play or is it just like stop doing what you're doing? Yeah, I mean, I think it's like a very, you have to be very, um, like I'm not, I definitely don't want to promote like, you know, um, just like greenwashing. Um, I think we need to look at transitioning systems. So I don't think still companies should own technology and um, I think they should do research, like kind of like how Tesla is doing. I think that's amazing where they're doing research and development and then they're like opening open sourcing mm. it to actually like address the climate crisis. Um, whereas I think sometimes a lot of the companies um, what they've done is they do research and development and then they keep it to themselves so they can make a profit. And I think mm -hmm. we're at the place in, in capitalism where we know it's failing us, unfortunately, and we need to like, like really look at places, 
ways that we can benefit not only the company but communities and i think for me it's it's being very clear with companies if they want to help in this transition they need to be a lot more transparent a lot more accountable to company to communities um, in the way that they run their companies mm -hmm. yeah and including yeah if, if there's a role for them to play we need to see a big shift and that we also need to see a big shift in the movement of capital and financial institutions because pre-pandemic yeah. we heard all of these announcements around you know blackrock and all of these financial institutions um talking about how they would change their policies um and yet like like you i'm wary of greenwashing yeah i think we don't want to like like i said replicate systems that haven't served communities and people um in this country, we need to see, you know, like a decentralization, like you said, and, and not a monopolization of energy systems, because that's not going to serve communities and in, in their empowerment of how they function and how they're able to su survive and thrive in like the pandemic, you know, this pandemic and future pandemics and the climate crisis. Because if we do not find a way to decentralize our energy systems, communities are going to be a lot more vulnerable because if they're just tied to one centralized grid and that, that grid gets shut down by a forest fire or something gets cut off, all communities are out of power instead of mm -hmm. decentralizing. Like it just, for me, it makes a lot more sense that communities would want to safeguard their ability to um, produce their own electricity, to produce hot water, to do all these things as opposed to in the future if they're not. Um, it, it makes communities a lot more precar in precarious situations. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So yeah, another question that comes to mind, I'm just not as familiar with what's coming up in the Q&A or what do you think? Uh, yeah, there's a question from, uh, from Susan, which was, what kinds of support or actions from non-Indigenous allies could benefit your work with Indigenous climate action? Um, I think one thing would be, um, is definitely like ampli amplification. I think when you see stories from Indigenous climate action or you see um, communities um, or organizations like ICA promoting certain like policies that um, to kind of throw your support behind what we're already saying. I think that's really helpful because I feel like for so long our can our voices have been silenced and marginalized and not uplifted. And so I think we're at a place where indigenous peoples know what the problems are. Um, so we know what the solutions are. And so I think if we, you know, just like, back home where I put up a solar project, like it really, I, it, the point of putting that, that project was to empower my community, but it was also to put pressure on the Alberta government um, to like, look, we're, our, we're just doing this with or without you. And, and then when the Notley government came in, they, they were, you know, I was asked to be a part of the Indigenous Electrical Technical Working Group, which helped push them more to include progressive renewable energy policy and include Indigenous inclusion. So I think it's just uplifting the stories and, and the work that Indigenous peoples are doing. We are our own experts. And I think that a lot of times um, people want to come in and, um, you know, think that they know what's best for our communities, but we actually know what's best. So I think it's like taking taking direction from communities in their in as they, you know, forge their own path. And I think for so long our communities have been disempowered. Like it was literally illegal to do a lot of things. It was illegal to hire a, a lawyer. It was illegal to gather in groups of more than three. So it means it was illegal to organize. It was illegal to do um you know, there was just so many, like we became such good farmers. I don't know if people know this history, but we became such good farmers when we weren't allowed to um, fish and hunt and forage. And um, even though those rights are now enshrined in the Canadian's constitution, we became such good farmers that the Indian Act basically didn't allow us to sell to other people that we had to go through an Indian agent. And we weren't allowed to actually even pro like to benefit off of like what we grew. So I think there's just, there's a lot of history where it, it showed that indigenous peoples weren't allowed to thrive through because of colonial policy and um, just uh, the support would be really helpful the amplification would be really helpful um, taking direction and working with we know at indigenous climate action we actually work with non-indigenous allies and we worked in, in in really great ways you know but it's it's really coming from a basis of understanding of um, self-determination and allowing Indigenous peoples to decide what's best for them, as opposed to a lot of times external um, decision making is still given out um, to communities. And you can imagine how frustrating that is. Um, so I think 
just allowing um, our people to speak for ourselves, but also uplifting and standing with us when we do. Well said. So for those of us that um, work in community or have newsletters or uh, let's make sure to share things on duly noted around amplifying stories. Uh, maybe one more question, Zoya, what do you think? Or, yeah. or Melina, if you see anything that you'd like to answer to. That's exactly what I was going to ask. This oh, okay. a question that Melina uh, saw in the Q&A. That was most exciting. Yeah, I mean, I see the two of them. There's, they're both great, um, the connections. Yeah, I definitely make connections with um, folks. I think it depends on, I can speak to that one quickly, but I also wanted the challenge of the sacred earth solar. Um, I think it. I think it's always important to have connections um, and make alliances with people across the board. I think um, we have this thing in in Western society where it's just like one person, one man, one woman is going to save the world. It's like no, we're all needed. We're all in all of our silos. We're all needed, and we need to figure out how to stop working in silos. So it's like we need to make connections. And he's um, Grant is saying you know, making connections with government or industry. And so, you know, there's, there's humans are humans and, you know, whether they have roles or not, but I think we need to, the basis of any relationship needs to be truth telling. And if we can go from there, then I'm, you know, I've worked with, when I did work on the indigenous electrical technical working group, I didn't work there, it was volunteer, but um, when I advised on that, um, in that table, you know, some of the government bureaucrats, they were honest and they were truth telling. And so therefore I trusted them more and I was able to, you know, give my input more of saying like, this is how indigenous peoples can be um, equitable partners in a renewable energy sector. Um, the biggest um, challenge for sacred earth um, solar is, yeah, I think it's, it, um, it's like, it's funding. I think it's like fine. It's a lot of times indigenous communities, um, what we're seeing right now and why I push for, um, renewable energy policy to support indigenous renewable energy projects is because some communities have been able to get it off the ground and work in partnership with government or industry or clean tech sector um, energy developers, um, but some communities haven't. And so with Sacred Earth Solar, what, we, what I've been doing is fundraising for communities on their behalf and then going and implementing projects into communities. And a lot of these are off grid, um, small scale because you know they're running on diesel in wherever they are and if, yeah, as we know batteries are expensive so for us I think it's like trying to find um, systems to uh, to empower communities to allow them to transition but I think again it's a bigger conversation because the jurisdictions of each place that we live in um, is 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 vast and different but I think also um, it's what we do see now more is like the philanthropic um, sector now funding more climate solutions and also cli and also indigenous climate solutions. So I think that's a really great thing that we've been seeing that's ch that's changed in the past like ten years, five years even. Thanks, Melina. I have so hard to answer everything. It's like no, oh, it's a lot. No, it's a, it's you're, this is amazing. This is fascinating. Um, I have one more question and then maybe we should, we've got about five, six minutes left. Is that okay, Zoya, if I ask the last question maybe? Um, it's kind of building from last several points and questions, um, but you noted before the idea of energy literacy and what you've been doing in your community. Um, I'm wondering, uh, it's kind of like twofold, um, what do you think needs to be done to support more learning and literacy around energy, um, especially for those that um, aren't as represented in some of these sectors that we've noted, kind of clean tech, clean energy. Um, so kind of like what, what can be done to support learning? Are there examples we can lift up of policies or programs? Um, and then as well, kind of like what advice do you have for people and people on the line about how to learn more? And you're still muted, Melina. Sorry. I was That's okay. Um, we need to see more investment. You know, I don't need to harp on that point. I think we've made it, but more yeah. investment for like, you know, a post COVID era, ensure that there's equitable um, investment going into the clean tech sector, green, green energy sector and, and strong policies brought strong robust policies being made. Um, programs that currently exist, though, um, there's a really great program called through Indigenous Clean Energy Social Enterprise um, that I'm a part of that is runs a Catalyst 2020 program. I was hoping um, you'd mentioned that. <laughs> yeah, and it, it's great because it actually, you know, it, it, it utilizes um, mentors from the clean tech sector and 
uh, like Chris Henderson, who's who helps uh, who helped originate the program. He, he you know, he's like a, a wealth of knowledge because he's worked on this for like thirty plus years. So um, it's it's teaching communities how to um, you know like negotiate PPAs, power purchase agreements. It's teaching communities how to understand the grids and systems that they're a part of, and how to ensure and to you know lobby for their their project to get to to bring it online and so i think that there's it's it's, it's amazing program um and i'm a, i was in the first cohort um it was after i put up my first solar project but it was just great to learn from somebody in that's been in this industry much longer than me and then also now i'm a mentor in each each other next iteration so i think there's been four cohorts now um, another um, resource that we're developing online through Indigenous Climate Action is uh, a toolkit, like a, a climate change worldview toolkit that will help Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples understand climate change through the lens of Indigenous peoples. And so that will be coming live online in the next number of months. And it's been, you know, work in progress for, through ICA for the past number of years of going into communities across the country and talking to communities about climate change and what it means with a, with a certain cultural lens. And then, um, yeah, what what was the other part of the question? It's kind of like what advice do you have? And, and that can be kind of closing points to what advice do you have for people that want to learn more? You've, you've, you've kind of answered Yeah, that. I mean, I'd say just like, I know we're all stuck in our homes right now. I'd say, obviously, when we're not stuck in our homes, we can gather, go to gatherings and events with that, you know, educate around um, these issues. But I would say for online right now, definitely go to Sacred Earth Thought Solar, go to Indigenous Climate Action, go to Indigenous Clean Energy. There's a lot of resources that are online currently right now through Sacred Earth Solar and Indigenous um, Climate Action. We're developing a just recovery guide. Um, so, and also go to Power to the People. Like it's it's just a, a feel, I think a lot of us are probably feeling pretty fatigued with getting just like inundated with bad news stories. I know for me, I've had to like limit my intake every day for bad news stories of like how many people are dying and all of the impact and all of the like heart-wrenching stories where you're like my heart just goes out to the struggle that people are feeling right now it's very real and you know mm -hmm. all of us are not immune to it and but I think power to the people is like a is not a feel good but it's a real it is feel good but it's also like an inspiring real truth telling about the history of this country but also the future and the visioning that's happening in this country and for me every time i watch an episode i feel i feel good after it and I'm not saying that's cuz i'm in it but because i really <laughs> i really like i just the the stories of the leaders of those communities are just like awe inspiring to me and i was just so happy to be in each of those communities so i'd say watch power to the people i think it's a, it's a really good um resource that i hope a lot more people utilize over the years thank you um maybe is there anything else that you'd like to add we have a couple minutes left um anything that you feel that we missed or that you'd like to say in closing um, it says, is Power to the People going to have another season of programs? Oh, yeah. We hope so. Um, it's just, it's on, it's interesting. And um, I think if you can, if you are watching right now um, and you've watched Power to the People or you watch it and you do like it, let APTN know. Um, that's an ask that the producers have asked people is like, let APTN know that you like this type of programming because this programming is like the first of its kind. Like you do not see this type of programming even in Canadian mainstream media. Um, I know I haven't. And so if you do like this type of programming, let, let them know because then they can let folks, our funders at the Canadian Media Fund know. Um, so the more that you can help us promote it, uplift it, share it with your friends and family, tell them to watch it on TV, um, it's, it's just, it would really help um, there be a second season. Thank you so much, Melina. It's been an absolute honor to speak with you. Hi, hi. Hi, hi. Thank you. Sorry, I almost need another cup of coffee. Sorry for stumbling on some words. No, but... that was, no, that was amazing. Yeah. <laughs> So I, did I miss anything? Do we have any, we'll send an email and follow up. Anything else that we want to say in closing? That's everything. Uh, okay. Thanks. Thanks so much, Melina. Yeah. Thank you we, everyone for joining. We appreciate you. Yeah. I appreciate you too. Thanks for holding this uh, discussion. Have a lovely day. You too. Bye all. Bye guys.